What is a Metroidvania? A miserable little pile of secrets! It's tough to nail down an ironclad definition, yet everyone seems to have a general idea of what one is. It's largely accepted that they're platformers with backtracking and upgrades and promises of ladies in bikinis. If only you can beat them fast enough. But despite how authoritative that criteria sounds, there are still degenerates out there who'll argue that Dark Souls is a Metroidvania. Metroidvanias are my favorite. I've probably beaten, and I'm pausing to ensure accuracy here, a thousand in my lifetime. I'm a hardcore Metroidvania enthusiast, so I just know what a real Metroidvania is because I feel it in my loins. But feelings won't get me very far with what I'm doing today, and that's ranking the top 10 Metroidvanias in all of video games. Therefore, I need to incorporate science. And the best way for one to science is to establish a proper definition for Metroidvania. So I'll just steal that from Wikipedia, make some adjustments for clarity, and voila! For this video, this is what I mean when I say Metroidvania. A 2D platformer focused on guided nonlinearity and utility-gated exploration and progression within an interconnected world where backtracking is possible. To break it down, it's got to be a side-scroller, I can roam aimlessly and play the game openly at points, I can be stopped because I haven't gotten the double jump yet, and all this action needs to take place on one huge level with biomes I can visit at any time. But to make this list official, we'll need more science than a simple definition. I've created an objective assessment full of objective criteria in order to administer an objective evaluation. I did that by creating five areas to rank each game by. And I quickly discovered that ranking video games is a completely subjective thing. But that's fine. You may not agree with my list, but if you're okay with being wrong, then I'm okay with you being wrong too. Let's go over the criteria. First is combat and abilities. Is combat fun? Is there a low skill entry but a high skill ceiling? Does the world get recontextualized with each added ability? How unique are these abilities? Progression. Is there a leveling up system? Can you upgrade your character with equipment or skill points? Does the progression's pacing make for a balanced experience? How quickly does the world open up to players? Exploration. How's the map interconnectivity? Is it logically laid out and fun to traverse? Are there lots of secrets and collectibles I actually want to find, and are they hidden well? Atmosphere. This is easily the most subjective criteria, but beyond whether I personally liked the game's music, environments, art style, and character and enemy designs, I will also objectively look to see if everything meshes together well to create a holistically engaging experience. And finally, story. Is the narrative interesting and well written? Is its delivery comprehensible or intriguing? Does it have a true ending and does getting that true ending add to the narrative? Now with the criteria set, there's only one more thing I want to do before we jump into the list. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the top five Metroidvanias I ain't played yet. So don't get mad if you don't see them on my list. Vernal Edge just came out and I'm in the middle of another game. That's my excuse. I'm hearing great things about its combat and music and the fact it was made by a two person team is pretty impressive. Vernal Edge will most likely be the next game I play. Infernex is a newer game I'm waiting to go on sale. It looks a lot like Simon's Quest and the music sounds amazing. There appears to be a system where you choose options like slaying or rescuing people. There's even a code you can input to turn it into Contra. I dig its art direction with all its grotesque zombies with their guts hanging out and stuff. This is definitely on my needs to playlist. I hear Shadow Complex is great. Some people even say it reignited people's interest in Metroidvanias. I don't know if that's true or not because I didn't pay much attention to it as it has yet to come to a Nintendo console. Here's hoping. Ghost Song looks a lot like Super Metroid, but with more punching. You play as an astronaut or something who appears to have a screw attack, shoots missiles out of its gun arm, and even interacts with something that looks like a Chozo statue. The enemies in the world look interesting, and the music teases a haunting experience. There seems to be a mystery you need to solve and NPCs to talk to. Overall, it looks great, but I'm just waiting for it to go on sale. I skipped to Moonscars at launch because reviewers said there was a game-breaking bug that wouldn't let them finish the game. The devs even confirmed this with a tweet. I'm hoping it's fixed by now because it looks right up my alley. Bleak and oppressive, the atmosphere just drips intrigue. The monochrome art style, accentuated with splashes of blood, calls out to me. I can't wait to play it. I just hope it's fixed. There. 
Now you can't complain I didn't put these on the list because I haven't played them yet. And with that tangent out of the way, it's time to move on to number 10 of the top 10 Metroidvanias in all of video games. You are Dorothy, a robot girl in search of her friend Rusty. Armed with a pickaxe and a lantern, you venture into a cavern with the help of a guiding light named Sprite. But rocks aren't the only thing slowing you down. Cultists, odd and hostile machines, and filthy humans constantly impede your path to the truth. SteamWorld Dig 2 is a blast to play for some reason, but it doesn't sound like it would be when you describe it to someone. You jump into a hole, smack your pickaxe into rocks, resurface to upgrade your equipment, and then dive back into the hole to do it until you beat the game. But somehow, this excites my little lizard brain. Every time I got a new pickaxe that made breaking rocks easier, a shot of dopamine would scratch my brain just right. It's an addicting gameplay loop. Something else that's addicting is traversing the map. From jetpacks to hook shots, Dorothy gets around in style. And like any good Metroidvania, you use this stuff to explore while searching for upgrades and abilities. But exploration can get tiresome, especially when you're pretty much underground smacking rocks the entire game. SteamWorld Dig shakes things up by adding some different environments, but not enough to keep things fresh in my opinion. But the game's weakest point is its story. Dorothy arrives to save her friend Rusty, but I'm not very invested in their relationship, and the game doesn't do anything to hook me. There's a whole angle about the humans, and a friend betrays you to spice things up. It's fine to keep things moving, but it's not the best motivator. I guess it just didn't make me want to explore the world. But to the game's credit, I wanted to explore the world because I was addicted. So there's that. Indra Shodhari is a billionaire CEO following a mysterious message from a missing colleague and corporate rival. The message? If you want to save your estranged daughter, come to Antarctica. Boarding her chopper, Indra books it to Antarctica, and what she finds there will literally change her life and view on reality forever. I thought the first Axiom Verge was great, but its sequel is on a whole other level. I understand the draw to the original, but Axiom Verge 2 does everything better. The first thing it improves upon is its emphasis on exploration over combat. Axiom Verge 1's combat focused gameplay led to so many guns, most of which sucked, making exploration less appealing. In Axiom Verge 2, your weapon of choice is CHILD SOLDIERS CONVERTED INTO NANOTECHNOLOGY. Also, a melee weapon and a boomerang. And though combat isn't the game's focus, it's still entertaining. I love the new hacking mechanic that lets Indra change enemy behaviors to do such things as join her cause or EXPLODE. Indra also has a skill tree that can be upgraded by finding flasks. This will increase your strength, improve your hacking skills, and increase your health. Finding flasks drove me to search every nook and cranny. The world, I must say, is impressive. I always appreciated when a Metroidvania takes you out from cramped corridors and caves and places you in the open air. But the real main event in Axiom Verge 2 is the drone. It has its own map to traverse, essentially doubling the game area. And the way both maps, different planes of existence I guess, interact with each other leads to some cool puzzles and secrets. The story, though lousy with convoluted lore, had me invested. I loved all the talk about the world stream, alternate realities, and learning about the past war in the area. But the game does a good job of keeping all that in the background and instead grounding the narrative around Indra and her conflicts. To the devs' credit, you don't have to play the original Axiom Verge to understand its sequel. Knowledge of the first game will either deepen your understanding of certain things in the second game, or give you some member berries. And it's not like it matters. You're going to leave this game confused anyway. I mean, what even is reality? What is consciousness? Who am I really? What am I even doing here? What are any of us doing here? Sorry, this game kind of broke my mind.
Sultan Sanctuary has your main character board a ship to protect a princess who is being ferried to a far off land to marry someone in order to stop a war. The problem is, you get an unexpected visit from Cthulhu himself. Predictably, this kills you, and unpredictably, you awaken on an island. Confused and most likely insane, you set forth on a journey to find your princess, spread your religion for some reason, and converse with the scarecrow from Jeepers Creepers. This is the portion of the video where it turns into a drinking game. Every time I say Dark Souls, take a shot. I'm just kidding. Please don't do that. I've read the script. You will die. Please, for the love of all that is holy, don't do this. I can't have my viewers dying on me. Not again. Sultan Sanctuary is the Dark Souls of Metroidvanias. Literally. It's just Dark Souls but made 2D. Obviously, this isn't a bad thing. It wouldn't be on this list if it was. If you've played Dark Souls, then you know what to expect when it comes to the combat in Sultan Sanctuary. Attacks are methodical and require a degree of commitment usually reserved for the one you marry. There's a stamina meter to make things harder, and oh yeah, the game's difficult. Where Salt differentiates itself from its inspiration is in its Metroidvania-ness. Specifically, there are abilities you must acquire to progress. Nothing mind-blowing that you haven't seen in other Metroidvanias before, like wall jumps, air dashes, abilities to make platforms or lower gates. The only ability worth note is the one that flips gravity. It leads to some fun puzzles and interesting combat scenarios, let me tell you that, Jack! Hey, want to hear something shocking? Surprise! Sultan Sanctuary ripped its leveling up system directly from Dark Souls. In this game, you get salt, the game's currency, from defeating enemies, and you use it to upgrade the world's, the world's most confusing skill, skill, skill tree. Tree. What the hell is even that? If you can somehow decipher this mess, you'll increase your stats and weapon and armor levels. And surprise! If you die, you lose all your salt and have to do a corpse run. I hate this mechanic because it actively discourages exploration, but I continue to love this game despite it. So I guess that makes me a masochist. Hurt me more. But you know what really hurts? Looking at humanoid characters in this game. Almost everything else about the art direction works. The atmosphere and environments are muted and dingy and macabre, and the music hardly exists. There's boss music, final boss music, and like maybe three other tracks. I'm good with the lack of music because what's here works, but what doesn't work is the lack of an in-game map. <laughs> that was disgusting, why did you <laughs> The story, though unique, isn't the best. First off, the finding the princess angle gets dropped almost immediately, and piecing together all the different biomes and their relationships becomes pointless when you discover that every area in the game is a replica that some weirdo god stitched together to make the most evilest place in the world. Why? For reasons. Also, one of the endings is you becoming the scarecrow from Jeepers Creepers and the ruler of Franken Island. For reasons. Whatever. I had a blast with Sultan Sanctuary, and I bet you will too, given you don't mind playing something almost entirely ripping off Dark Souls. Dark Souls! Now's a good time to do a short intermission, because this is my video, and I want to talk about some Metroidvania garbage I've played. Batbarian, Testament of the Primordials is actually a decent game. The story is interesting enough, though the writing is a little too comical for its own good, but the world genuinely interested me. Batbarian's real problem is that it's not a very good Metroidvania. If I could succinctly describe it, I'd say it's a puzzle platformer you play inside of a bag because it's so damn dark all the time. Luckily, there are accessibility options you can toggle to adjust this brutally difficult game, and thankfully so, as I wouldn't have completed it otherwise. Greek got real boring real quick. You have to swap between characters to solve puzzles you immediately figure out upon seeing them. The puzzles are more of a test in patience than intellect, as little babies can solve them with their stupid little baby brains. Also, I don't want to solve a bunch of puzzles. I want to explore and find upgrades and fight monsters. The story is pretty sparse too. I get it's an indie game, but the ending felt more like the end of Act 1 instead of a fully fleshed out narrative. In the end, I just dropped it because it felt more like a chore than a fun video game. A bullet hell metroidvania? What could possibly go wrong? A lot, as it turns out. I bought this game day one because I thought it looked interesting. Boy was I wrong. The main character is a Mary Sue with zero flaws. Any semblance of conflict between characters is snuffed out immediately, and the overall gameplay drains your soul because every enemy is so tanky. Maybe it's because I suck at twin-stick shooters, 
but I did not like this game, even though I wanted to. The less I say about Super Epic, the better. I straight dropped this game. I hated the story, I hated the level design, I hated the biomes, and I hated the combat. There was nothing here to keep me going. I guess the whole thing is an allegory for how we're consumed by entertainment or whatever. I can't remember. I fell asleep. Dead Cells is a great roguelike, but it's a terrible Metroidvania. Stop putting it in your top Metroidvania lists, you rubes. <sighs> Glad I got that out of my system. Let's move on to number seven. Ori, after using his searing, unholy light to commit genocide against the adorable baby creatures of darkness, joins a makeshift family and immediately tries to off the last adorable baby creature of darkness by directing its flight directly into a raging thunderstorm. The two get separated, and now it's up to Ori to hunt down the baby and finish the job. Right out the gate, Ori and the Will of the Wisps hit you in the fields as you watch a family get torn asunder. And things don't let up there as Ori is immediately attacked by a gigantic wolf. The opening is amazing, just like the heart-wrenching intro of the first Ori game. But this is where things diverge for the two games as everything Wisps does is simply better. For starters, Wisps' combat does the correct thing and specs into a strength build, discarding the cucked beta projectiles of the first game and instead opting for based alpha sword swings. Ori also has three adjustable slots to equip other manlier attacks, like ground pounds and spear chucking. It's a vast improvement over the passive combat from the original. What both Ori games got right were his abilities. Unlike most Metroidvanias, Ori doesn't feel weak. You see that wall? Climb it. You like double jumping? You'll get that early. Want to fling enemy projectiles back at the enemies? <laughs> the point I'm getting at is Wisps, unlike other Metroidvanias that want you to feel weak and gradually get stronger, very quickly turns you into a badass and grows you to become badassier. Case in point, the way Ori uses his abilities to traverse the map feels like butter. Jump, air dash, bash, Hello. double jump. Boom shakalaka! I'm on top of a mountain now. Other Metroidvania protagonists would need to learn how to fly or something to get where Ori does by just running around like a coked up monkey. And which one of those sounds more fun? Environments in Ori look... Nice isn't the word. Being in that cave with the spiders isn't nice. Maybe it's more apt to say, every environment in Wisps looks the best it could possibly look. You want a serene forest? Ori nails it. Creepy Abyss? Nails it. Swamp with a huge frog god? Nails it. Wisps might be the most beautiful game you can ever play, and this will motivate players to explore its map in its entirety. Moreover, there's NPCs and side quests this time around, fleshing out this already fascinating world. And you know with side quests there comes rewards. These rewards can come as spirit shards you can equip to augment Ori, or spirit light orbs you can use to level your abilities or skill tree. The only place where Wisps falls flat is its story. It's predictable and boring. Sure, it's bookended with EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! But the rest is kind of mundane. It works to push the game along, but it does little to keep my attention. It's a good thing everything else Ori does, it does very well. Welcome to the dystopian world of Earth, where a nuclear holocaust has left the world barren. Decades after the fallout, towers emerge from the ground, one of which starts poisoning the struggling village's water supply. Three heroes band together to explore the mysterious tower to stop the poison killing their people. I almost skipped Asylon because of its character swapping mechanic. I had already been burned by Greek memories of the Azure by this point. 
But against my better judgment, I gave Astellan a try, and I'm really happy I did because it is the very definition of a hidden gem. Character swapping is cumbersome at first, but it isn't awful. You have three characters to swap between, and each character has their own set of abilities needed to traverse the tower. Sometimes you need the knight to chop down vines, sometimes you need the wizard to magic up some magical balls, and sometimes you need the archer to do some... But, you can only be one character at a time, and this can lead to some bothersome backtracking. Here's a common scenario. Let's say you're the archer, and you come up against some vines that need chopping. You're out of luck and must trek all the way back to a campsite to swap to the less vine friendly knight. This never feels great, but thankfully camps are everywhere. Plus, you eventually find an item that lets you swap characters on the fly. Combat's nothing special and just as you'd expect. The knight chops, the wizard magics, and the archer arches. There are optional characters you can find, a kid who throws garbage and a dude who is basically Simon Belmond. But they suck, so I won't be talking about them. Each character has abilities and stats they can upgrade, and the only way to do that is to DIE! Turns out, the wizard Algus sold his soul to the devil so he and his friends can get resurrected upon death, and so Algus can get access to the super secret devil store where he can upgrade everyone's abilities and stats. I loved this because death only made me STRONGER, which didn't help with my metroidvania addiction. Just one more run, then I'll stop, I swear! However. Death also meant you had to go back to the beginning of the game every time you died. There's an elevator that shuttles you to different parts of the tower, but the backtracking was still a pain, though finding keys and buttons to unlock shortcuts helped. Speaking of keys, there are keys and locked doors everywhere. But, keys aren't specific to certain areas, so I took keys from one biome and used them in another. This always led to amazing rewards and made me feel like I was exploring places I wasn't meant to, and that is the hallmark of a fantastic Metroidvania. There are all kinds of spots like this in Astalon. Hidden shortcuts, entire biomes off the hidden path, even areas that aren't on the map at all where the music cuts off. Spooky. Oh, oh, my God! oh, did I mention the music is awesome? Just listen to that track, baby! Besides copious backtracking and character swapping, another misstep this game has is its true ending. Obtaining it is too video gamey. It starts out alright, you have to find an old man in three different locations in order to make a homunculus. The homunculus has a piece of Algus' soul in it and is intended to be given to the devil or titan you made the deathless pact with, thus simultaneously allowing Algus to fulfill his contract and also not get eaten himself. So, you'd think having the homunculus would be enough to get the true ending, right? It's false. No way. Not this time. Not this time. No. Apparently, you also have to fill in 100% of the map. Why? 100% of the map has nothing to do with the narrative. Why do I have to see all the rooms in this tower? Does the homunculus have to approve its feng shui first? Just take the creepy thing away already! It's looking directly at my soul! Aside from that, the narrative overall is interesting despite the ending leaving more questions than answers. You all should definitely give Astalon a playthrough. You are Soren, or you were. Now you're a grease stain on the ground thanks to some immortal asshat wiping your entire squad. Luckily, death has other plans for you. Resurrected and given immortality yourself, your new charge is to infiltrate Cyridon and destroy the source of immortality. Cause, you know, death isn't too keen on people not dying. As you can imagine, it's bad for business. Death's Gambit Afterlife is 2D DARK SOULS! <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Dark Souls is a very influential series, and it's influenced the hell out of Death's Gambit. From its methodical combat, to its leveling system, to its corpse running, to its death idols resurrecting all the enemies you've killed, to its class options, to its weapon stat scaling, to its... <sighs> Listen, let's just say it's 2D Dark Souls and get on with it. Well, now that we know what Death's Gambit's combat and progression system is like, let's move on. Death's Gambit, 
unlike Dark Souls, is a Metroidvania in that there is ability gating requiring you to obtain abilities to ungate things. Double jumping, temporary unlimited double jumping after eating flour or whatever, butt stomping, etc. And there are skill trees to upgrade your stats and offer class bonuses. But Death's Gambit's real differentiator is its superb narrative. I don't want to spoil too much, but it hits all the tropes I like. Fantasy, sci-fi, cosmic horror, and it does it all while also focusing on the main character, who has a name and a backstory and a voice and everything. There's a legit story being told here. There's even a few twists that actually threw me for a loop. Needless to say, I was invested, and because of that, I wanted to explore every bit of Death Gambit's world. Unfortunately, it didn't stick the landing with its ending. There's DLC that helps, but I just YouTubed it. On principle. I want to briefly talk about the cosmic horror aspect of Death's Gambit. I'll say as little as possible to preserve the experience for any losers who haven't played it yet, but I will say you fight something akin to an outer god. And the battle between Soren and this outer god plays out in a spectacular fashion, much like how I'd imagine a battle against an outer god might actually be fought. I was thoroughly impressed. Also impressive? Death. He's my favorite. He's funny and cool and looks cool and has a cool robe and he's tall and can cook and... Notice me, senpai. Do I even need to give a summary for Symphony? You're all familiar with the game and are probably sitting there thinking one of two things, either how is Symphony of the Night not number one, or sweet, Symphony of the Night isn't number one. For everyone thinking the former, please hear me out. For everyone thinking the latter, oh, don't worry, I'll find a way to disappoint you. Just ask my father and my wife. <laughs> oh god, that made it sound like they were the same person, that's so gross. Make sure to edit that out. Let's get the record straight. Symphony of the Night is the GOAT. I just think three Metroidvanias are just a little bit better. I've beaten Symphony 30 something times and that's not an exaggeration. I played it so much throughout high school when it was brand new and I've been playing it every Halloween since. I have a deep and profound love for this game and it solidified my passion for the Metroidvania genre. However, it's not perfect, but we'll get to that. Let's start with the good, the combat and abilities. Alucard makes you feel like a god. Nani? The way he feels when he moves, the way he looks when he moves, all the overpowered equipment and weapons he uses, and Dark Steel! Then he has the bat form and the mist form and the uh, poison mist form. There's no doubt Alucard wouldn't absolutely spank every other protagonist on this list. But that's the thing, his game's too easy. Without a threat, what point is there in being a god? To cause others to suffer. Continuing with the good, pretty much everything else. Alucard levels up as you chop monsters in half, you can find stuff to increase your things, and it's always a delight to explore and find new armor and weapons. Unfortunately, a lot of what you find will be weaker than what you currently have, leading to chronic exploration blue balls. Don't get me wrong, Dracula's castle is fun to explore, just not fun to explore twice and when it's upside down. And the clock tower is never fun regardless of its orientation. But you know what is fun? The camp. Whether intentional or not, Symphony of the Night is aggressively campy. I know you all know the Richter Dracula intro by heart. Fuck! And that's just the beginning. The camp only gets worse slash better from there. I'm a brooding vampire femboy tortured by his bloodline and his past. Now, watch me super jump into this librarian's butt 50 times to get a vest. <laughs> Thank you! Let's talk about some of Symphony's bad parts. First, and it feels heretical to say this, it's atmosphere. I know I might be in the minority when I say I don't like its atmosphere, but I'm not wrong when I say it's an incoherent mess. I'm talking about two things. One, the music. As badass as it is, it rarely fits the environment it's in. And two, the enemy designs. They're great, but they're all over the place. We have Greek mythological creatures, Egyptian monsters, cosmic horror, a scarecrow on a stick. None of it meshes well. It's like the devs just wanted to cut corners and recycle all the assets from their last games. I bet you didn't even realize I spliced in some Rondo footage here. Ho, 
Oh, oh, oh shit, I got you good, you fucker! And Symphony's story leaves a lot to be desired. Dracula's castle has returned, a Belmont has become the bad guy, you stop him. It works and has a decent twist, but I forgot about it amidst all the exploring, ridiculous enemies, and phenomenal music. But I don't want to forget the story. I want stakes, tension, conflict, intrigue pushing me forward. The lack of urgency, combined with how unthreatened Alucard is, turns the assault on the Dark Lord's domain into a pleasant stroll with some slight inconveniences here and there. For example, the part where Death steals your clothes was kind of a dick move. But I can never be angry with Death. But which one do I choose? <laughs> However, I'll always be indebted to Symphony's greatest contribution to the Metroidvania. The staple of achieving the true ending. Walking the path of real redemption, finding the MacGuffin of proper salvation. If not for Maria giving Alucard the holy glasses so we could experience the secret latter half of the game and perform PATRICIDE FUCK! We might not have multiple endings in Metroidvanias today. Overall, Symphony's campiness creates a tonal dissonance against its gothic atmosphere. Honestly, I find the silliness to be an integral part of the experience, but I prefer games that nail a tone and stick to it throughout. You're definitely going to see this in the last three entries. It's intermission time once again. This time, let's do some honorable mentions. Metroidvanias that I think are good, but are just lacking something to make them great. Cave Story is a brilliant love letter to gaming, and I loved it. 20 years ago. It hasn't aged well, and I personally think it's too linear to be a Metroidvania. Or, at least, to be a very good Metroidvania. It'll always hold a special place in my heart, even if it hasn't aged particularly well. Look, La Milana is kind of a son of a bitch, and I'm not afraid to say it. If a Metroidvania could be a bully, La Milana would be the O'Doyle to my Billy Madison. Its traps are unfair, its secrets are indecipherable and obtuse, and it's just plain hard. There's a lot I respect about La Mulana, but it's just too esoteric for me and probably 95% of Earth's population. If you beat this game without a guide, you are a stronger man than me. Maybe if the devs were just a pinch more forthright with some of their puzzles, I think La Mulana has the potential to be one of the greatest Metroidvanias. But, as it stands, it's a big ol' pile of dumb doo-doo, and it's mean. The Messenger is fantastic, but only half of it is a Metroidvania. I highly recommend everyone watching this to go and play it. It's incredibly designed, super funny, and has a lot of challenging platforming sections. And though saying the messenger isn't a great metroidvania might be divisive, I think we can all agree, that is a really cool hat. Unsighted is a wonderful game with a very stressful timed mechanic that you can toggle on and off if you want. It was specifically designed to be speed ran and sequence broken just like a true metroidvania. Its only problem, it's not a 2D side scroller. It's an isometric platformer. I know, pedantic, but the rules is the rules. If I let Unsighted into the Metroidvania Club, what's to stop Dark Souls? It's all about the principle. Sorry Unsighted, great game though, you all should go play it. Man, I don't know what it is about Wonder Labyrinth. It looks and plays so well, so well that people say it looks and feels like a spiritual sequel to Symphony of the Night. So what stops it from achieving greatness? Seriously, you all go play it and tell me what it's missing. Maybe it's the claustrophobic map, maybe it's how you never feel like you can just let loose and kick some real ass. I honestly don't know. Regardless, it's an outstanding Metroidvania that's just missing something. Alright, let's finish this. The top three Metroidvanias in all of video games. Given life once again by the Grievous Miracle. The penitent one in silence must trek the twisted world of Xvistodia and save its people by committing the highest form of blasphemy, slaying the last son and ascending the throne to become the new father and son of the Grievous Miracle. Blasphemous is easily the most pretentious entry on this list. Listening to any NPC talk will make that excruciatingly clear, from their overly verbose dialogue to their inability to give a single shit about how confused they make you. Take Diogracius, the first NPC you talk to. He has dog dew on his face and babbles about the Mother of Mothers and all other kinds of nonsensical BS. 
it perfectly encapsulates what religion sounds like from the heathen perspective. This game takes the player and dunks them headfirst into Custodi's grisly world with the enthusiasm of a Baptist preacher behind on his quota. But damn, it hooks you real good. You are the penitent one, some no-name jabroni who wakes up among a pile of dead guys. And things somehow only go downhill from there. Soon, some jumpy boy appears, providing a great opportunity to either learn to chop and dodge, or to get absolutely smeared, both of which are valuable learning opportunities. Completely against your will, you're immediately immersed into this messed up world that, out of morbid curiosity, you just have to explore. Exploration feels like, well, like you stumbled across something that you shouldn't have. Often I found something and said, this is the worst thing I've ever seen only to wander into the next thing and say it again only louder while clutching a crucifix. You cannot comprehend how ugly and scary and unsettling Blasphemous is and that makes it perfect. Blasphemous sets its tone very early and sells it the entire journey. Every NPC you encounter is tragic and horrifying and side quests are disturbing yet satisfying and fruitful either narratively by expanding upon this gruesome world, or materially because you just got some broke-ass prayer that negates all damage. I hope you like collecting things because boy does Blasphemous have you covered. Rosary beads, health upgrades by taking swords out of this woman's boobs, nasty and oddly descriptive bones to unlock an optional boss who is the worst, and world-changing relics. Unlike most Metroidvanias, the Penitent One doesn't get standard upgrades to traverse the world like double jumps. He uses relics blessed by the grievous miracle that alter the world, like hair that makes trees grow into bridges, or a toenail that lets you walk on terrain unhindered, or blood-soaked sand that creates floating blood platforms you can jump on. <laughs> Man, this game just does whatever, doesn't it? And it does it all excellently, especially combat. It's fast-paced and responsive with blocks and evades and parries and all kinds of offensive and defensive prayers, i.e. magic. There's only one weapon, the mea culpa, a sword created by beating a statue through a woman's chest? You can upgrade it by switching out its heart, by finding sword upgrading statues, or by spending the in-game currency at upgrade statues instead of donating it to the church. The monster. That's really the extent of upgrading within Blasphemous. A traditional leveling system would have been welcome as this game is Nintendo hard. Enemies will kill you, forcing you to do a corpse run because guess what? Dark Souls! The enemy design in this game, especially the bosses, are just terrible. But I mean that in a good way. They're so disgustingly beautiful, except for the baby. I hate him! They all look like masterworks of pixelated art. It's almost a shame when I have to stomp them to death. As alluded earlier, the world of Custodia is sublime. Grotesque, grim, grimy, and not at all pleasant to be in, yet I can't get enough. There's not a single biome or environment where I don't learn something about this world, its people, and its suffering. And that, my friends, is Blasphemous's bread and butter. It's storytelling. Whether it be from item descriptions, the environment, or from Dog Do Face himself. Come. I loved hearing about the Twisted One, the Dream, and the Come. I was enthralled from beginning to end. But what makes this game top tier is how you acquire its true ending. Everything you must do to reach the real game's true resolution just makes sense. Finding the fourth hidden golden visage, obtaining the secret holy wound, and taking in all of Custodia's guilt by destroying those guilt statues all makes narrative and thematic sense. It all builds onto itself and feels like a true path to completing this quest. You're not just equipping a hidden item, you're redeeming people, challenging the status quo, and discovering a path that follows a creative logic that blows my mind. Blasphemous, by far, has the most satisfying journey to a true ending in any Metroidvania and an even more satisfying ending. It truly is masterful. Why should I give a summary to Hollow Knight? The game certainly doesn't care to set itself up to the player. 
And it's not like this game even needs an introduction. I guarantee, as of this video's release, every single one of you are still impatiently waiting for Silk Song to come out. Gosh, I really hope it's out before I release this video. I've been working on this thing for ages. Surely, Team Cherry will have at least given a solid release date. Surely. Hollow Knight is a king among Metroidvanias, and it absolutely deserves the title. Which is odd for me to say, because I absolutely hated Hollow Knight at first. It took me four tries before I finally got addicted to it. Why so many tries? Probably for the same reason cited by everyone who hates Hollow Knight. It's too hard to start. Hollow Knight just drops you into its hostile world with little more than a nail and a good luck. I don't recall saying good luck. But I promise, if you stick with it, you too will fall in love with Hollow Knight. What makes Hollow Knight so good? Personally, I think it's its story and combat. We'll talk about its story later. For now, let's start with combat. Of all the games on this list, Hollow Knight has the lowest skill entry but the highest skill ceiling, meaning combat's easy to understand but deeper than you'd think if you're skilled enough. A lot of the combat satisfaction comes from its fluidity and the way enemies force you to continually concentrate on your positioning. With time, your little knight can become a deadly yet adorable agent of DEATH. Progression for a little knight isn't very robust. You can upgrade the nail and murder the blacksmith if you're the worst person in the world. And you can upgrade abilities and HP and soul containers through exploration. Charms can be used to augment your little dude, but again, a traditional leveling system would be great here because the game can be quite hard because DARK SOULS! <laughs> Usually, corpse running discourages me from exploring. However, I found myself hopelessly consumed by curiosity for Hollow Knight's world. You want to explore Hollow Nest, not just for the charms and Geo, but because you want to know what happened here. What's the infection? Who are the dreamers? What happened to the Pale King? Who is the Hollow Knight? As you travel its superbly interconnected world, which I feel is the most well-designed world in any Metroidvania, you're inundated with so much environmental storytelling. This is the bulk of how you learn about the lore and world of Hollow Nest, coupled with item descriptions and NPC dialogue because DARK SOULS! <laughs> At points, Hollow Knight's atmosphere left me dumbfounded. The claustrophobic and oppressive tunnels of Deep Nest, the eerily beautiful entrance to the City of Tears. The game is equal parts beautiful and haunting with an underlying sense of dread permeating throughout your journey, intensifying as you delve deeper into the abyss. The secrets you uncover along the way are shocking, their implications frightening. It's easy to get sucked into the engrossing narrative and desolate world. And the path to the true ending is almost on par with Blasphemous. It's a logical, creative, and enlightening trip with a truly epic payoff. You can either become the next Hollow Knight, or create a world that doesn't need a Hollow Knight. I'm definitely in the majority when I say the final battle with the Radiance is one for the books. A true ending well earned. What I don't find outstanding with Hollow Knight is its art style. Though consistent and well designed, it's just not my cup of tea. And the game is super silly. Silliness infects this game to create tonal inconsistencies, like the Dung Defender, Mr. Mushroom, the Grub Father, Zote, and other silly things that are just silly for silly's sake. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, it's just not my thing. But what is wrong is the map system. I hate having to find the map, rest at benches to update the map, and equip a charm so I can see where I am on the map. That's dumb no matter how you slice it. And maybe some more guidance through clever game design would help players grasp how to start the game and not feel so alienated in the beginning. Ultimately, these are all minor gripes and do very little to detract from a stellar game. If you haven't played through Hollow Knight yet, you're doing yourself a great disservice. Its reputation is well earned. A little girl awakens on a pristine bed with white sheets covered in glass shards. The pale light emanating from her body scarcely illuminates the area to reveal a broken containment unit around her, though she has no recollection of what it is or its purpose. 
Her head throbs as she sits up for the first time in who knows how long. She squints at the surrounding darkness. An empty church comes into view, its buttresses and pews rotting from the passage of time. Unearthly groans bellow throughout the dilapidated halls, and the soft, rhythmic sound of rain against the faded stained glass windows conceives an eerie omen. A cloaked figure, wielding a blade, suddenly manifests before the girl. She shrinks beneath his towering form. Do you remember what fate befell this land? he asks. The girl timidly shakes her head. The figure sighs. It may be best for you to see the state of things outside for yourself. Anyone who's played Ender Lilies knows it's not the most mechanically unique game out there. Its UI is one for one copied from Hollow Knight. It even copied Hollow Knight's charm system with the relics you can put on Lily, the game's protagonist. Just because a game uses elements from other games shouldn't discount it automatically. Hell, I can sit here and tell you all the stuff Hollow Knight copied too. Dark Souls! <laughs> but what Ender Lilies does, both new and old, it does exceptionally well. Combat, though initially awkward, eventually comes into its own. After all, Lily's just a defenseless little girl. She flops when she tries to dodge, and she doesn't attack directly. Instead, she calls upon spirits to do her dirty work. But I assure you, Lily doesn't stay weak for long. Every ability unlocked makes her stronger and look more confident. Silly looking belly flops in time get replaced with slick glides through the air. And it's satisfying to watch her grow. The abilities in this game are admittedly pretty standard. Double jump, dash, wall climb. But it's the presentation that gives Ender Lilies its flair. Lily doesn't just climb walls. A spirit digs its claws into the cement and cradles Lily as they ascend. She doesn't dash. A spirit clutches her to his chest while he sprints and skewers enemies with his lance. At no moment during Ender Lilies will you ever forget that you're a little girl in a world that wants you dead. And the only thing stopping the zombified abominations from ending your Lily are the spirits she saves along the way. See, to get abilities and spirits, Lily must first save them by cleansing them of the blight that's ravaging their body and souls. As you've probably guessed, these blighted spirits will be your boss fights for the evening, and the special on today's menu is pain. Not every boss fight is a bastard, but most are. Ender Lilies, like most modern games, has been influenced by Dark Souls, <laughs> meaning boss fights are hard and they hit even harder. I never found any boss to be too difficult, but there are some real jerks in this bunch, but I always felt satisfied after overcoming them, and not just because it was a well-met bout. At each battle's conclusion, Lily purifies the boss's body, freeing it from the blight and allowing its soul to finally leave its decaying, fleshy prison. As the liberated spirit joins Lily, their memories enter her mind, and this is why I fell in love with this game. Every freed spirit has such a tragic backstory, with the common thread being that every boss was once Lily's protector. Each had sacrificed themselves to eternal torture so they could save this defenseless little girl in the hopes that one day she would awaken and use her powers to save the land. Unbeknownst to them that Lily's actually a clone meant to be sacrificed to her unwilling host in a never-ending loop to an endless war. Anyway, now that Lily's finally awake, she can return the favor by unbinding their trapped spirits from the monsters they've become. And even in death, the spirits rally to Lily's side to protect her. Maybe it's the fact I'm a father with two daughters, but this hits home. Never in my life have I had such motivation to defeat a game's bosses. These aren't enemies. They're guardians who gave up everything and are still willing to give up even more despite being dead. It's powerful and made me hungry to learn every single bit of lore this game had to offer. And in my ravenous search, not only did I find an intriguing story of colonialism and genocide and ancient magic and corrupt science and a greedy king's quest for immortality, I found a mother. A mother using what's left of her body to hold back the blight from consuming the rest of the world and to save who she considered her daughters. This is where Ender Lily's true ending comes into play, masterfully weaving an emotional narrative with creative logic to pique the player's curiosity and empathy. Lily is given a choice. Allow her mother to purify her of the blight she's been absorbing and leave Land's End so she can have a normal life or refuse her mother's and guardian's wishes and stay in hopes she'll find her mother, even if it means joining her to share her painful struggle for all eternity. It's a powerful and motivating gesture that connects you with Lily and her world. 
It's not just a MacGuffin you equip during a boss fight, though it certainly is exactly that. It's saving your mother and everyone who sacrificed everything to give you the opportunities you have now. It's obvious Ender Lilies ranks so high because of its narrative. I love the characters, the story, and its delivery, and I love its world. Moreover, I really think it might have one of the best soundtracks in a video game. The OST adds so much to the dark and depressing atmosphere, and I'm not entirely sure how. Some tracks are haunting and creepy, but most are upbeat or have an anime girl vocalizing. It's almost like the music itself is trying to tell you there's hope for this world. Whatever. All I know is I like it and it makes Ender Lilies pretty unique. And there's so much more to Ender Lilies that I love, like its art direction, enemy and level designs, and combat but it's not perfect. The verboten domain, Ender Lily's final biome, is one of the most stressful things ever put in a video game. And the only thing uglier than the monstrosities Lily and her spirits cut down in this game is its in-game map. Holy Jesus. What is that? What the fuck is that? It looks like a flow chart made in Microsoft Office, but it's incredibly functional. It uses color coding to let you know if there's still something left to find in a room, and it highlights alternative exits with a little red dot. Every Metroidvania should copy these functions moving forward, just maybe not make it look so ugly. Other things Metroidvania should copy from Ender Lilies is the ability to return to a save room from the pause screen and give fast travel as early as possible. I get that backtracking is a staple for the genre, but we can all agree that less is more in this respect, yeah? Overall, Ender Lilies' gripping narrative pushed me to want to explore more than any Metroidvania has in a long time. And the satisfying feeling of watching Lily grow and how each gameplay mechanic intertwines with the narrative as opposed to feeling video gamey cannot be overstated. The immersion for this game is top tier. And it's deservedly building a solid fan base. It's clear anyone who likes Metroidvanias will fall in love with Ender Lilies just as hard as me and a million other players have. There you have it, my top 10 Metroidvanias in all of video games. Every game on this list is worth playing, especially if you have even a passing interest in the genre, and I highly recommend you go play every single one. All that's left to say is thanks for checking out my video. If you have any recommendations, let me know in the comments. My goal is to play every single Metroidvania I can get my greasy little hands on. Who knows, maybe in a few more years I'll look back at this list and laugh at how inaccurate it is because so many great Metroidvanias have come out since I uploaded it. If that's the case, I've got a message for my future self watching this right now. Is Silksong out yet? Tell me it's fantastic. Just tell me it's finally been released. Give me a reason to live for the love of God!